Hatred or greed, paradise is the place we need. I feel the peace, feel the peace inside of me. Greetings and peace. This is Dr. Lawrence Brown with another episode of Interfaith Issues. The place where we discuss the issues of common interest to the monotheistic religions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. As we have for the last few issues, we're going to continue by discussing the doctrinal differences between Christianity and Islam and how we can rectify those differences. We left off with the discussion of the Christian proposal of Jesus Christ having been the Son of God, and that led into discussion of the Trinity, and after that, the alleged divinity of Jesus Christ. So, we are at the point, we are discussing the alleged divinity of Jesus Christ. And the point of this talk is to take the specific evidences that Christians hold up, and as uh, suggestive in their minds of Jesus Christ having been divine, and provide the refutation for those. So, to begin with, if we ask Christians, why do you feel that Jesus Christ was divine? What, what was it that he did or say, said or was that makes you believe he was divine? A lot of Christians will say, well, look at the miracles he performed. Okay, fine, but what prophet did not perform miracles? Miracles was one of the ways in which our Creator showed the prophet to be a prophet to the people to whom he was sent. If we think of biblical miracles, we think of a lot of things, but I defy anybody not to remember Moses parting the Red Sea. This is one of, the, one of the largest, greatest miracles we can imagine. All the same, we have to admit that the miracles wrought through the hands of Jesus by the power of God were very impressive. An important point is that Islam does not deny the fact that Jesus Christ performed miracles. Islam just teaches that he performed the miracles by the will of God. And this is consistent with Jesus' statement that he of himself can do nothing. So let's look at some of the miracles that Jesus is recorded as having performed. Um, we are told that he fed thousands with a few fish and loaves of bread. All good and fine. But does that make a person divine? Elisha fed a hundred people with twenty barley loaves and a few ears of corn. He granted a widow such an abundant flow of oil from a jar she had that was running dry, but as a miracle developed such an abundant flow that she was able to pay off her debts and, in addition to paying off, save her sons from slavery and live on the prophets. So, Jesus Christ is not alone in the performance of miracles that had something to do with providing sustenance. Jesus healed the lepers. Elisha healed Naaman. 2 Kings 5, 7 through 14. For that matter, the disciples were bidden to the same service in Matthew 10, 8, namely to heal the lepers. What would that make them? Jesus cured a blind man. Again, Elisha has to be weighed into the equation. He not only struck his enemies blind, but he restored vision to the blind through prayer. 2 Kings 6, 17 through 20. Jesus raised the dead. Elijah beat him to it. Having raised two children from the dead in 1 Kings 17, 22 and 2 Kings 4, 34. And once again, the disciples were bidden to raise the dead in Matthew 10.8. Again, the question arises, what then does that make them? 
Jesus walked on water. If he had been around in the time of Moses, he might not have had to. He cast out devils. So did his disciples. So did the Pharisees. So did the wayward followers that are described in Matthew 7.22, who cast out demons, but who Jesus will disown. So, does performing miracles mean that a person is in any way divine? Cannot be, because we have too many from among the prophets who performed similar miracles. Scriptural predictions. A lot of Christians will say, well, but the Old Testament predicted the coming of Jesus Christ. True. The book of Malachi also predicted the coming of John the Baptist. In addition, there are many passages which predict the coming of a third prophet. And those predictions are not satisfied either by John the Baptist or by Jesus Christ. It is for this reason that the Jews expected three prophets to follow. That is why we read in the New Testament that the Jews sent their Levites and priests to question John the Baptist and ask him who he was. They asked him if he was the Christ, and he denied. If he was Elijah, and he denied. If he was the prophet, and he denied. Once wasn't enough. They repeated. They said, who are you? They asked him who he was. If you are not the Christ, if you are not Elijah, if you are not the prophet, who are you? Elijah, the Christ, the prophet. So we know that they were expecting three prophets to follow. Where? From their scripture. Does scriptural prediction convey divinity to anybody? Of course not. Well, exhibit number three, the concept of Jesus Christ being described as a savior when God is also described as a savior. Many people say, okay, God was savior, Jesus Christ was savior, therefore, Jesus was God. Well, if we are going to use that argument, we have to look up the word savior. The word in the ancient Hebrew was yasha, Y-A-S-H-A. Now, this word is found 207 times in the Old Testament. It includes references in Judges 3.9 to Othniel, in Judges 3.15 to Ehud, in Judges 3.31 to Shamgan, in Judges 8.22 to Gideon, and many other anonymous individuals. So if you are going to say that being Yasha, being Savior, makes you equivalent with God, you have to invite all of these other individuals to the equation. And obviously we cannot do that. So this is another evidence we have to cast out. Exhibit number four. John 8.58 records Jesus Christ as having said, before Abraham was, I am. Exodus 3.14 records God as having informed Moses, I am who I am. A lot of Christians actually hold this up as an argument, and they say, Jesus Christ said, I am. God said, I am. Therefore, Jesus is God. Well, once again, the, the scripture pokes fun at this kind of reasoning. What Jesus is recorded as having said is emi, E-I-M-I. It was uncapitalized. It's a humble little word. It's unprepossessing. It's non-exclusive. It occurs 152 times in the New Testament. 152 times, but it's only capitalized once when Jesus is recorded as having said it. 151 times, it's not capitalized. I think everybody can understand the significance of that on their own. However, the point is that in Exodus, God is recorded as having spoken either in the Hebrew, haya, or the Greek, Septuagint, as haon. Neither of these is equivalent with the word imi. The translation to I am makes them look equivalent, 
but they are not. Now this kind of games playing or lack of fidelity to the translation is transparent. And for that reason, modern Christian scholarship, which is much more discriminating than the Bible translators of the past, have reduced this to much more honest, forthright translation. The New International Version, the Revised Standard Version, the American Standard Version, they have all uncapitalized the word I am. It's in small caps now. It is one step closer to recognizing the fact that this is not a valid argument. Evidence or exhibit number three, the right-hand man, Mark 16, 9 through 20, presents Jesus as sitting at the right hand of God. However, this verse has now been rejected from many Bibles. Bart Ehrman puts it very simply, saying, quote, but there's one problem. Once again, this passage was not originally in the Gospel of Mark. It was added by a later scribe. Well, even if you think about the possibility of Jesus having sat at the right hand of God, he's sitting at the right hand. Does this equate him with God? In Isaiah 44, 6, we read, Thus says the Lord, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. But here we're saying that beside him on the right hand is Jesus Christ, and that makes him God. God says, besides me, there is no God. In Isaiah 43, 11, he also says, besides me, there is no Savior. In any case, it is recorded in Genesis 5:24. And Enoch walked with God. What does that make him? Let's take a break. Please bear with us. We'll just be a few minutes, and then we'll be right back. Is the place we need. Welcome back. This is Dr. Lawrence Brown continuing this episode of Interfaith Issues in which we are discussing the alleged evidences for the alleged divinity of Jesus Christ. We have worked our way up to evidence number six, in which some Christians claim, well, maybe Jesus was divine because he forgave sins. Again, John 5.30 quotes Jesus as having said, I can of myself do nothing. So it is a reasonable understanding that, yes, Jesus Christ conveyed the forgiveness of sins, but was not the one who forgave sins himself. A deeper question is not whether Jesus had the power to forgive sins, but whether that would make him equal to God. Now, the Pharisees allegedly believed yes, uh, but Jesus corrected them, and the scenario goes like this. In Luke 5, 21, quote, And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Well, the argument is that the Pharisees believed that Jesus Christ was God, so we should believe it also. It's a wild argument. The Pharisees are the ones who persecuted Jesus Christ. They are the ones who delivered him into bondage. They are the ones who tortured him. They are the ones who delivered him to be executed. They hated him. He disavowed them but we are to believe what they say. It's a very, very strange argument. So when we, when we consider this argument, perhaps the first thing we should consider is not just what the Pharisees were saying, but how Jesus Christ responded to it. In the very next verse, Luke 5.22, Jesus Christ rebuked the Pharisees with the words, Quote, why are you reasoning in your hearts? This is the rough scriptural equivalent of calling somebody a blithering idiot. Why are you reasoning in your hearts as opposed to reasoning in your mind? The fact of the matter is that Almighty God would not deny being God. 
if the Pharisees presumed him to be God, Almighty God would say, of course, finally you figured it out. What took you so long? How many times do I have to say it? How many miracles do I have to show you? But that's not what he said. What Jesus Christ said was to rebuke the Pharisees and show them that they were thinking wrong, that he was not claiming to be God, and by nature of forgiving sins, that did not convey any divinity upon him. Exhibit 6, the concept of Jesus being Lord, God being Lord. So once again, they're called by the same word. So the conclusion is that God is Lord, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is God. Um, again, apparently not. Why? Because Lord, to call somebody a Lord was a custom of the time. It was a sign of respect. Sarah called Abraham Lord in 1 Peter 3.6. Thomas identified Jesus as my Lord and my God. Now, one big problem with that, he's saying my Lord and my God, as if they are one and the same. But in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, we read, yet for us there is only one God, the Father, and only one Lord, Jesus Christ. One verse says my Lord and my God. Another verse says there is only one Lord, and there is only one God, and these two are separate from one another. Exodus 4.16 compounds the confusion because in Exodus 4.16, Moses is described as God to Aaron. Not as God. He's described as being God to Aaron. It's metaphorical. It's metaphorical language. It is clear and transparent. And yet, some people still hold up this argument. Keep in mind, we are talking about a Bible in which pagan gods, in Exodus 12:12, 12, 12, 18, 11, and 23, where judges, in Psalms 82, 1, and 82, 6, angels, in Psalm 8, 5, and prophets in Exodus 4.16 are identified by the same word Elohim for God as the one true God is described by. So how much can we trust the equation of saying that one person called Lord becomes partner with God? Not at all. The word was too liberally applied to others. Exhibit 8, worship. People were described as worshiping Jesus Christ, but that's not quite correct. It's a mistranslation of the word proskuneo, where others were described as subjugating themselves to Jesus Christ. But following this word in the text, we found that Peter... According to Acts 10.25, Peter, as he was coming in, quote, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. In 1 Samuel 25.23, Abigail fell on her face before David and bowed down to the ground, again, worshipping him, using the same word. 2 Kings 4.37 speaks of a woman who fell at Elijah's feet, bowed down to the ground, Genesis 50, 18, 2 Samuel 19, 18. They describe similar events. Obviously, again, this was custom. It was custom to pay homage to a righteous and pious individual, especially to a prophet. If they worshipped him, why didn't they pray to him? But prayer was reserved to God and to God alone. Some say, well, Jesus Christ had foreknowledge. He had foreknowledge of things to come. Well, we know that that's not quite true because when Jesus Christ speaks of the day of judgment, he describes that none know of the day of judgment except for God, not even he. Let me quote Mark 13, 32. But of that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but the Father only.
but the Father only. Clearly a disconnect between Jesus Christ and Almighty God. So what is the point that we have arrived at? We discussed in the previous episode the fact that the scripture does not support the proposal that Jesus Christ shares in divinity. Similarly, the arguments based upon what Jesus Christ said, what he did, and what he was, do not support any proposal of him having been a partner in divinity, any more than it supports any other prophet or pious person who performed the same miracles or did the same things. It is clear that these people are united in one thing. They are united in humanity. With that, I am just going to remind everybody that this is a deep subject. It is a long subject. In the time that we have, we have only touched upon it. Those who wish to look more deeply into the evidences, please go to my website, www.leveltruth.com. It's spelled exactly as it sounds, Level Truth, L-E-V-E-L-T-R-U-T-H. The book to read at first is this one, Misguided. And this will, inshallah, lead you to the second, Got it. For those who are looking for an action adventure, something more interesting, a, a fictional novel who will take them through many of the same thoughts, look for the Eighth Scroll on eighthscroll.com. So once again, this is Dr. Lawrence Brown concluding this issue of Interfaith Issues, hoping that you will tune in next time. But for now, peace. I feel the peace.